Welcome, comadres and friends. I am Nora de Hoyos Comstock, national and international founder of Las Comadres para las Américas. <clears throat> the leadership team and I are pleased to have you join us for tonight's teleconference as we're celebrating our sweet 16. It has been our privilege to support Latino authors throughout these 16 years, and we look forward to many more to come, which means you all need to keep writing. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to readers following us on our live Twitter chat at Read Latino Lit. Tonight, please help us welcome authors Ana Reyes, Dr. Alma Zaragoza Perry, and Dora Maria Abreu. These interviews will begin shortly. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Remember, keep yourself on mute. You can keep your video on, but remember that we can see you and your movement may be distracting. We suggest you put yourself on speaker mode. That's so that you can see the big picture of the author that's being interviewed, but gallery works just as well. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we will try to get to them. First, let's start with uh, a few, let's see, our book club's history. Comadre Tess? You're on mute. <laughs> Oh, I love those words. Perdóname. <laughs> Hola a todos. I am Tess Tobin, project manager of the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club. Our first book club gathering was in July 2004 in New York in Comadre Maria Ferrer's apartment. After a brief hiatus, Nora Comstock re-envisioned and relaunched the book club nationwide to promote the work of Latino authors to every book lover, to bring our community to bookstores and to support our Latino writers. We started our teleconferences in October of 2007. This year, we're celebrating our sweet 16 and are delighted to be sharing works by Latino authors with all of you. We created the teleconferences and book club to entice everyone to read more Latino authors and to learn about Latino roots and the different perspectives on Latino culture and heritage. Our book club and Zoom teleconferences are open to all, not just Latinos. We are creating a space for everyone to explore the Latino writer's mind and soul as portrayed through the written word. We encourage you to join our local book clubs in your city or time zone. We have clubs in 12 cities that are meeting virtually. There is sure to be one that can fit your schedule. If your city doesn't have one, why not help us start one? For more information about our book club, visit our website at latinolit.com. So please invite others to join us. Comadre Karen, take it away. Welcome, comadres and friends, to our May 2023 Zoom teleconference. I'm Karen Gonzalez, Assistant Coordinator for the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club, Denver Comadres Book Club Facilitator, and co-founder of the Colorado Alliance of Latino Mentors and Authors. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we begin our interviews with Ana Reyes. Ana has an MFA from Louisiana State University. Her work has appeared in Bodega, Pair Noir, New Delta Review, and elsewhere. She lives in Los Angeles, where she teaches creative writing to older adults at Santa Monica College. The House in the Pines is her first novel. Interviewing Ana is Comadre Shirley Yanis, a Guatemalan New Yorkan content creator, co-host of Gigets Chat, a book and movie review channel on YouTube. Shirley and her sister Christy enjoy reading books, manga, watching movies, anime, and singing their hearts out at karaoke. They were a producer for the Latino Film Market Film Festival. They love supporting independent content creators, authors, and film projects. Comadre Shirley, take it away. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm on mute. Okay, I'm on mute. I was making sure. I was like, oh, am I still mute? Hi, everyone. Hola, comadres. Hola, everyone. Hola, Ana. Thank you for um, letting us interview you. I guess letting me interview you. Um, actually, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I love your flower. Thank the you. It was a very, it was a last minute touch because I didn't, I want, I saw everyone else was doing a flower and I was like, how fun. I got to get one too. So I just plucked this from my mom's yard. 
<laughs> yeah, and it pops. The color pops. Um, I just wanted to say, um, first thing, quick. Um, this is actually the first thriller I have ever like read in a long time. I'm not even lying. And it was like, it's such a page turner. I was like, oh, oh, okay, hold on. Um, I don't really re read thrillers. If you saw the bio, it's more like mangas and like comic books and stuff like that. So sorry about that. But um, no, it, it was amazing. And congratulations on being re on Reese's book club. That's pretty Thank amazing. you. So, okay, let's get started. So can you give us a like a brief synopsis for anyone who wants to pick up your book about what this book is about? Sure. Um, so it's a psychological thriller and um, it's about a young woman whose best friend died when they were 17 years old. And she has to go back to her hometown essentially because the man who she believes killed her seems to be doing it again. Um, and she has to return to this house that he built in the forest. It's uh, the house in the pines, the house of the title. And there's a secret in the house. And only by returning to this place, this mysterious house that he built, um, is she able to find out uh, what happened there, what he did, and, and if he is indeed uh, killing women. Um, so it's a thriller. Um, but as you mentioned, um, it is, uh, there's also some, you know, there's a story within this story, and that's kind of where we get the uh, Guatemalan reference, uh, where there's a story within a story. Uh, like myself, the character is half Guatemalan, and her father had written a book before he died. Um, so there's kind of a lot going on there. <laughs> oh, that was actually one of my questions. I, I actually asked, like, um, I, I didn't know you were Guatemalan. You you said you're half Guatemalan? Half, that's yes. Oh, cool. Because I was reading it and and I'm half Guatemalan on my mother's side. Okay. So I never really read a lot of books with Guatemalan history in it. And just um, getting um, Maya's perspective on like not knowing her history as much because she didn't grow up with her father. Spoiler alert. Spoiler mm -hmm. alert. Um, and, you know, not knowing like Spanish or anything like that. And I like, uh, you know, I was like, Maya, I feel that because, yeah, I'm not good at Spanish either, Sally. But um, so I kind of like connected with Maya, you know, in the sense. And, and so oh, thank you for that. So that's cool. That's cool. So, um, yeah, the next question is, uh, can you talk about the process of writing your first novel? And also, well, this is another second question in that. Um, wh why a thriller slash like horror genre? Yeah, um, so the novel would started out, I was in a master's of creative writing program in Louisiana, and we had to write, you know, we're, it was creative writing, so we had to write something for our thesis, and we could do a, a collection of stories or poetry, and I just decided I'm going to go ahead and try to write a novel. Um, so I wrote the first draft in about a year, and then I had um, some really great professors who were advising me and um, giving me notes on that first draft. And it wasn't really a thriller yet. It was more of a kind of literary story um, about this girl who, who was reading a book by her dead father, and it kind of had something to do with, with the central mystery, but it wasn't yet a thriller um, until after I graduated and I put it aside and I came back to it about a year later and I found an agent and the agent was the one who said, you know, you've got this great mystery here with the house in the pines. You know, this house is very creepy. It has a, a mysterious secret, but you're not really building up to that in a way that is is as, uh, you know, page turning as it could be. Like you could be giving us a lot more suspense uh, leading up to that twist about the house. Um, so she kind of helped me re-envision it as more of a thriller novel and helped me think about it that way. Um, and because that's actually my favorite genre to read, it just felt very natural to me um, to kind of learn how to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a whole set of rules and tropes that go along with that genre. Um, so for me, learning those things um, was really helpful and kind of helped me turn it into a more suspenseful book. And yeah, and you feel it with not only um, Frank, <laughs> who's the other character, um, at, you feel it like Frank and, and the house, the cabin, basically, they feel very, they feel real, but they also feel um, mysterious, like they're not real. If you get what I'm trying to say, like, yeah, they totally. kind of like fairy tale like. Yeah, I, I love that you said that because fairy tales are some of my biggest influence. Um, you know, growing up as a kid, I, I always wanted to hear the fairy tales. 
And I, I was kind of inspired in a lot of ways by those stories of children getting lost in the woods, you know, Hansel, Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood. There's so many stories that I grew up hearing um, about these children in these deep, dark forests that kind of had this almost like, um, almost like magical sort of feel to them, um, but also very horrifying. So that was definitely the tone that I was going for. Mm, great, great. Thank you. Um, in the book, you mentioned the Guatemalan Civil War, which I was like, whoa, that's actually really interesting. And I love history. Um, Maya's father was living as a young man through the Guatemalan Civil War as yeah. part of a student organization fighting back against the armies present in the village in the highlands. How did you start researching that aspect to include it into the story? Well, I knew I knew a lot, a, quite a bit about the Guatemalan Civil War because that was sort of the reason that my family came here um, when my dad was a child. So I grew up not going to Guatemala because, you know, my family coming here um, when they did, they just felt like, oh, it's really dangerous. You know, you really, we really don't want to bring you there. My dad just wouldn't bring me there. Um, so it wasn't until I was seventeen that I, I finally got down there for the first time, and it, for me that was really important because I grew up hearing so much about Guatemala, not just from my dad, but from my grandparents um, in really loving terms, like, you know, how beautiful it was and how, you know, you could get fruits there that you can't get here and things like that, that my grandmother would talk about that. Um, but at the same time, they told me that it was very dangerous. So I had this, like, it lived in my imagination, um, really large. Like I, I had this whole idea of Guatemala. And then by the time I went there, uh, when I was a teenager for the first time, it actually met this whole side of my family that I had only ever heard stories about. Um, that just made a really big impression on me. And so for me, like kind of learning about my that side of my family is kind of what I ended up writing about in the book with my main character, who also has to learn about her side of the family, um, who she doesn't know. So there was a lot of parallels there. But, but I think I learned about the war both through what my dad said and then making a making a point of reading about it because they really don't teach that. I mean, you don't learn about that in history, um, you know, largely because it was sort of, you know, a U.S. backed <laughs> um, coup. So, you, you, you know, we don't really hear about that in history classes. So for me, get, being able to write about that and kind of, you know, weaving it into the story just felt really important. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Uh in the book and yeah talking about like you don't like learn that in in history at all I mean I didn't know about like Coca-Cola and and like the assassination they were doing part of like part of the U.S. and stuff like that in Latin America I didn't know about any of that until I like researched it so yeah, yeah I mean it's very important even if it be a fictional story to bring up those aspects but then you can look it up you know you'd be yeah. like oh what's this about let me look it up so thank you for that. Um, that goes into the other, actually into my other question about the racist belief that countries and neighbor, neighborhoods that are dominantly BIPOC are dangerous. Um, Maya's mother believes in this idea. She keeps on like telling her that out of, you know, probably out of her own fear and trauma that it is dangerous. Um, and was that aspect important for her uh, Maya's mother's character because ultimately it feels feels like Maya's character as well, because she's scared to learn about Guatemala in a sense or go where her father was from or see her family. Well, that's what I was getting from it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's true, you know, because when I go there now and I go visit my family, um, there is a sense of, you know, you really, you could get pickpocketed, like you really kind of have to carry your things in the front, you know, like, and, and keep an eye on your things the whole time. So that I think that, you know, that is a reality, certainly in, in Guatemala City, you know, when you go there. And it's so complicated, because, you know, so many of the, it's so much of why it's like that is so complicated. And yet, you know, going down there, you have to be careful. And so for me, like, showing that reality about how you can't as a, especially as a woman you can't just really go walking around Guatemala City um and just kind of showing that reality versus um you know the beauty of the country like the beauty of the of the of the uh, volcanoes and of the towns like Antigua and, and Panajachel, like all those beautiful, beautiful places, um, you know, sort of next to, contrasted with that reality of yes, a lot of very bad things happened here. You know, the civil war was horrible and, you know, my family had to leave. A lot of people had to leave. And so there is like this 
this darkness there that I think is, you know, hard to ignore. Um, and the contrast with all the beauty there and the beauty of the culture is just, it makes it a very dramatic place, at least in, in my imagination. And I feel like that's probably what, what comes through in the book when, you know, she's in this place and she wants to explore and her family is saying, you know, you're a young woman, you can't, like, you don't get to just go out and, and wander the streets. No, yeah, it's it's true. And and you get that. But she, yeah, like you said, she wants to explore because you want to learn your history and stuff yeah. like that. But and I think both aspects can be true. Yeah. Places are dangerous because people are dangerous, but also there's people who 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 make it beautiful, you know, there's architecture, there's anything that makes that country beautiful. So it it can be both true, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. That's, you yeah. know. Um, so yeah, um, but thank you. Uh, so you understand it took seven years to write this novel. Can you share with us like some challenges you found while writing this novel and who was there to support you along the way? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the first draft, when I wrote it as a student, I had some really excellent professors who were reading, you know, reading it in chunks. So I, I would give them like the first third of it and they would give me notes before I went on to the next part. So that was really huge. Um, and then afterwards, I joined a writer's group when I graduated. And that was also really helpful because to have somebody to have like a group of people that are also doing what you're doing. I mean, it's a marathon. So we're all kind of in the trenches together. We can celebrate our successes, but also commiserate when things aren't successful. Um, so having friends and also my husband reads everything I write, my mom. Um, so just having people who supported me along the way, there was definitely times when I wasn't sure I was going to finish it when I was like, you know, what, I'm put, spending all this time in it. Is it ever really going to get published? What am I doing? So there was times when I wasn't sure I was going to finish it, but it was the people around me that always um, kind of encouraged me to go back to it. So I have them to thank really for, for supporting me through those seven years. Wow. No, that that's that's important, man, to get to get. I, I can't even imagine how it is to write a novel and all that work. And then aside from that, you have like your main job. So yeah. it's like, you know, and you're stressed out. And so it always helps to have people support you to get something yeah, it's crucial no it, it definitely is crucial um so um we heard that your book was option for a movie is that going to go through well that's not totally um it's sort of in negotiations right now there's a writer strike so um i think that that's going to slow everything down but there was some interest um, from a company called Gato Grande, and they are a film production company, um, and it's very far away from anything actually happening, um, but they are in negotiations to option it, and what that means is that they'll have, I think, a year or a year and a half to try to get the financing and get, you know, make, get the movie um, rolling and if they don't do that within a year and a half, then I can try to sell the rights again. So I'm actually just learning about this in real time. Um, but it's it's still a long ways away. But of course, it's that would be like my my dream. <laughs> but I, I hope it works out because I'll, I'll go see it. I'm like, oh, OK, cool. No, no, I definitely hope it works out. Um, so last question. What are you working on now? And will it be scarier than this one? I am working on another scary book. Um, I'm still, I'm kind of superstitious. So I want to finish the draft before I tell anyone what it's about. Um, but it's, it's, it's the same genre. It has some of those same elements where it's, um, you know, there's some horror, it's a thriller. There's some questions that you have to keep reading to find out. Um, so I think it's very much in the same vein as this book, the first book. Oh, cool. Cool. That's great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Anna. That that was actually uh, all the questions I had. And um, congratulations. Thank you for making uh Maya's character and you know Guatemala up in here, more characters from Guatemalan descent. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> but thank you and have a great night. Thank you so much. It was nice talking to you, Shirley. <laughs> nice talking to you, Anna. Thank you, comadres. Gracias, comadres. Our second interview is with Dr. Alma Zaragoza Petty. Alma, PhD, is a Mexicana social justice advocate and scholar who teaches equity to create change. Born in Los Angeles, but raised in Alcapulco, Mexico. For much of her childhood, she is the daughter of immigrant parents and a first-generation high school and college graduate. 
Dr. Zipi, as she is known to her students, is committed to fighting injustices and imagining life-affirming spaces in education and social impact sectors. She released her first book, A Personal Narrative on Healing and Justice, titled Chingona, Owning Your Inner Badass for Healing and Justice. The book is a call to reclaim our roots, the pain and the beauty of it in order to step into full Chingona territory. Interviewing her is Comadre Lynette Correa Velez, a first-generation high school and college graduate, Boston Rican, mommypreneur, co-president of Velez Diversity Consulting and Career Coaching, and founding director of Tech Launchpad, a racial and gender equity-centered tech initiative at Kennedy King College, KKC, at City Colleges of Chicago. Lynette is a trained Hashtag critical career coach with over 20 years of professional experience in co-empowering Jodonas, Chingonas, and everyone in between from all industries with the DEIAJ centered lens, a passionate advocate of closing the racial wealth, wealth gap for all. She was a 2022 National Colorway Tech Fellow. Take it away, Comadre Lynette. Wepa. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Dr. ZP, as I see in your um, name right now, I am fangirling like crazy. Uh, so forgive me if I stutter over my words today and we'll be recorded. So I will do my best. That's very sweet of you. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Um, so interestingly enough, when I was asked and invited to interview you today, uh, or this evening, wherever you are in the U.S. Um, I was actually reading your book via audiobook on Scribd. So um, I will show your book because also I love the color yellow for all the fans and future fans in the room. Um, so of course, I have to ask the first question. Um, tell us a little bit more about your inspiration for your book, Chingona, Owning your inner badass for healing and justice for those that haven't had a chance to read the book as of yet. Yeah. So my inspiration, I think, is twofold. One of them was as an avid reader, um, just kind of learning a lot about healing and self-care, self-love. I've always came across these amazing stories of like white black women who like I learned so much from because they were vulnerable enough to open up and let kind of like their stories be out in the world. And yet I also kind of longed for a connection that felt more culturally relevant and just kind of like my life, you know, and I didn't see my life kind of represented. And so one of my biggest inspirations was just my own experience, like really wanting to pick up a book by a Latina who gets vulnerable, who is not ashamed of that vulnerability and that, you know, shows sort of like the scars and the healing that they went through um, to really sort of, you know, come to who they became, right? And another inspiration for my book is I've worked with um, low-income first-generation backgrounds as a, through my own journey in, in school as well, in, in college. And I've always been inspired by what these students are able to accomplish. Like all of the things, all of the intergenerational you know, traumas, um, bumps along the road, financial insecurity, just all the things that they deal with to come out and, you know, pursue uh, their dreams and, you know, what they see as success as becoming sort of college graduates and onto like, you know, careers. And so I was really inspired by that too. And I just wanted to give back to my community somehow beyond sort of, you know, the ways that I felt like ac the academic sphere kind of constricted me to. And so I published outside of academia, because I just felt like there wasn't really a venue through academia to just tell my story and tell basically younger me's like, hey, I see you, I'm here. I kind of went through the same thing. You're not invisible. You are going to make it, you know, and kind of just provide that reassurance to the next generation. Absolutely. I mean, as I was reading your book, I felt uh, not only seen, but affirmed. Um, and I'm sure many of us who have read your book would probably say the same thing. Uh, for you, when you were writing uh, Chingona, 
you talked about how almost like the the history and her story and their story of the word chingona. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit uh, per your research and what you wrote? Yeah, so it's so interesting because as, you know, when I was writing, the, the writing process can be such a, its own thing to talk about and just like all the twists and turns that happen and just serendipitous moments and things like that. And so anyway, as I was writing the book, I like, I didn't set out to write the book on being a chingona, right? I was like, I'm just going to write about my story and like, see what I come, you know, like, we'll see what it'll be named. Like, of course I had to like pitch names, but I don't think chingona was even in like the first pitches that I made to publishers. And so later as I kept sort of um, digging deeper and trying to really understand what I was trying to say and just through the writing process, kind of coming to understand that more, I realized like, oh, I don't need to look beyond my culture to find these examples, you know, of these brave, amazing women that have fought really hard in their, <clears throat> excuse me, in their like families and in their professions. Like even my, I, you know, I started thinking about my grandma. My grandma was a badass. She was a chingona. She was an elementary school graduate, like didn't go beyond elementary school, but some of the rhythm she had in her life that really kind of like invited the sacred in and just really invited, um, you know, the neighbors into like community and, and just all the ways that she just lived her life was so impactful. And I remember just thinking like, oh, there's like, there's this amazing woman in my own backyard, like my own metaphorical sort of like life backyard that like, I can look to as an example, and I've never seen her in that way, right? Like sometimes when we get um, to a place after a lot of like trials and tribulations, um, it takes us a second to recognize like, oh man, like actually there were these amazing people along the way, you know, at least for me, this is, that's how my journey was. And so I kind of looked back and saw like, okay, what were some of those examples and how can I better exemplify who they were beyond sort of like this, you know, more of a, kind of like, you know, professional, white professionalism of what success means. And I thought chingona just captured that really well. And so then I started digging, you know, diving deep into the chingona, like the, the um, history of the word where it comes from. And so I unpack all of that in the first few chapters and then kind of come back to throughout. But basically this idea that, um, you know, it has really just very um, violent gendered roots of the first mixed children of the indigenous and the Spanish Spanish conquistadors, basically the product of their rape is what were called chingones. You know, they were called hijos de la chingada, which is another way where that word comes from. Or ch and because it comes from the word chingar, which in a lot of Latin cultures means to F. I don't know if I could say bad words here or, you know, English bad, <laughs> we English got you. bad words. We're picking up what you're putting down, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll say all the Spanish bad words because maybe people won't really get offended about that. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then I started to understand more and more how amazing it is that like these younger Latina generations were like, we're starting to embrace this term and we were calling each other chingonas and, you know, just really kind of stepping into what that meant. And I heard Sandra Cisnero, who, who was Sandra Cisnero, who was one of my like idols growing up as a writer. Like, I remember her kind of talking about this term too. And I was just like, it's so amazing that it's kind of like, if you're a Latina, you've heard this before, but then there wasn't like a through line of like, okay, but what is it to us? Like, what is the history about it? Like, how do we all kind of get in, in there, you know, with like our own histories and things like that. And so I just came up, I just became obsessed with that term. And I just kind of wanted to know everything about it. I wanted to share it with my community and I wanted it to be a pride of, you know, a point of pride for us that like, yeah, we don't have to understand ourselves with other, you know, um, ways of sort of saying you know like I'm I, this is the only thing I can think of right now but you know for example like that that term lean in right that like white women talked about in terms of professionalization and I like I understand but I'm just like I don't know that I get that and I don't know that if I, my soul feels that <laughs> the way that chingona does like if you tell me like lean into your chingona okay now I get it you know <laughs> and so I just wanted to have to yeah to just kind of let everyone else if they didn't know about this and just kind of like um, take pride in our own history. Now I really love that and I really appreciate not only your social justice oriented lens but your critical lens right um, as you were examining 
uh, both your academic, well, all three, your personal, professional, and academic journeys. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you discussed in the book? And this was a, an amazing discovery for me as well. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, how Chola is part of Scholar. Oh, yes. So this was another thing that um, I came across as in my research with this book. Um, you know, for a really long time, I lived with this duality of having been a, I don't know, I guess, you know, I, I don't want to give all the details of my book, but you know, there's <laughs> in it, in it, I just talk a, a just little, a, bit about a, my, a little appetizer. My, my stint. <laughs> yeah, I talk about my stint as a chola and how I felt rejected even by the cholas because basically I was allowed to walk out of the gang because they were like, wait, you're smart. You have straight A's. Like your your parents care about your grades. Like, why are you in a gang? And I, I would have never, you know, living through that, all I felt was rejection. I was like, wow, even the cholas don't want me. Like, you know, like I, I was in such a hurt place that it just felt like rejection. But as I grew older and I was able to reflect more, I realized like, actually, this was probably the first example of a mentor slash leader in my life. This person that saw something about me that I couldn't even see about myself and that were basically like really, really launching me out there to like dig deeper into that, you know? And, and, and for a long time, I kind of battled between that sense of like, I want, I was a smart girl, but I was also in a hood growing up in a, you know, in a, in a place where gangs were sort of a normal day of life. And for a long time, I really sort of went back and forth on like trying to understand my place and where I was headed in my future. And, you know, someone, I recently talked to someone else who was like, it's so interesting that that would even be like a thing that you would consider. And I was like, yeah, because when you're living in it, it's reality, you know, like, of course, as an outsider, it's hard to see how some kids end up in, in gangs and kind of doing that for life or just, you know, becoming kind of uh, OGs and their gangs and stuff. But that happens because you're because of the options you see around you and because of the people that you see around you. And so I was so excited when I learned about, you know, just uh, these amazing East LA um, women who started this term of, you know, just really, really realizing that like the the chola, the word chola is embedded in scholar, and that they really took that as an idea of like you don't have to choose, girl. Like it's both, it's A and B, you know. And and I really resonated with that because I learned a lot from my stint as a chola, but I also became a scholar over time. And I don't want to deny that part of me because it made me who I am. And I don't want to be ashamed of that part of me either. And so I just really love that Chola is inside of Scholar now. And, and yeah, I just love digging into a little bit of that history too. That is amazing. Um, I live here in the South side of Chicago um, in one of the worst cities in Chicago, but I also talk about how the South side of Chicago is historically disinvested in. And um, and sometimes the system works exactly how it was meant to work. Uh, you talk a lot about that in your book. So in, in your experience as um, a scholar in the classroom uh, at the university level, you know, what were some things that was really difficult for you at that time um, that also inspired your book? Yeah, man. Um... My own doctoral process was really intense. I was kind of set aside by other Latinas who had left the program and was kind of given like an informal like um, orientation <laughs> into how unwelcoming and toxic it might become in the program for me. And I had just such rose colored glasses at that time that I was just like, okay, I'm hearing you, but I'm also like, I was so excited to start and I was so excited to just kind of continue my own journey that I don't think I really paused with that as long as I should have, you know, instead I just kind of like, and I also talk about this in my book, how for a very long time, because of my background um, and just kind of going through some trauma and, you know, intergenerational issues uh, with alcoholism, for example, in my family that I had in many ways still needed to develop uh, emotionally, there was a lot of things in my own development that uh, were scented because of just my background and or that weren't developed. And because I kind of saw academia and education as kind of my savior for so long, 
like I just dove into that and like didn't really do a lot of my own personal work on like myself. And so, you know, through the program, it just, a lot of these things really came to light and, and I just really started experiencing you know, being called, I mean, up to like just being called names, like I was called a socialist, I was called all these other things in the classroom by professors, you know, for example, one time when I asked like how long the length of a paper should be, it was like, you know, it should be enough to pick my interest, like not too short, where like, you know, think about it like a skirt, not too short where it's too revealing, but like not too long where it's not interesting anymore. And I was like, these were like actual things that were said to me by white professors. <laughs> And I was just like, what the heck is going on? Like, I just remember like not understanding the world because for me, I thought when you get to the PhD level, that's where all the like real smart people are. This is where the, all the, this is where I'm going to learn, you know, all those like social emotional, like things that like, I should also like check about myself, my biases, my prejudices. No, it was not that it was the opposite of that. It was like, and so when and I was very reactive at that time because like I said, I hadn't like dealt with my own stuff. And so I just remember like constantly fighting and trying to like change things. And yeah, that's a lot of the basis of my book. And so now as a professor, I teach at USC here in LA. Um, I teach a course in inequity. And one of the things that I like to do is give my students a, like, you know, as best of an experience as possible when it comes to support and how we can really show up as full humans in that role and allow others to also know that, hey, you're more than just these like, um, you know, your analytical power and your sort of brain, you are a whole person, like you have emotions, you have a family, you're, you're managing a lot. And so I don't think that I'm that some of that made it into the book, I feel like that's, you know, something that I've recently kind of dug into more. But in the book, I do talk a lot about just those challenges that as people with with my kind of, ex, you know, background and experience, those parallel kind of journeys that we're having both professionally and then academically and social emotionally and how much work it is on us to like really put in and to like get to that type of level. And that's why we see a lot of, you know, I'm a big proponent of like Latinas getting to that highest level because we just need to have more profess professoras, you know, there's like, we're the most underrepresented in the professorate and we just need more like us out, out there so that others can be inspired to you know, live out their dreams too, and go as far as they want to go as well. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the ways that I think my program impacted me and the ways that I've been wanting to change that in my own classroom. Yeah. Uh, plus one on all of that, um, especially since I am a third year doctoral student in DEI and education, um, but I did have to pause. Uh, so very similarly uh, to the information that uh, you just shared, because uh, life happened, right? Um, so second to last question, um, I saw an interview recently uh, with Sandra Cisneros, and she talked about how um, in her latest book, she wrote about her family and how her family may or may not have been speaking to her while she was writing her book and when the book published. Um, you read a lot about your family also in your book. How's that going so far? <laughs> What's your family? <laughs> it's so funny, like I get this question a lot um and interestingly enough like I think my mom the way that I describe her she hasn't changed much so if you if you read my book and you, and you see kind of how she is <laughs> she's kind of the same so she's just very stoic like like honestly like growing up and I used to see all these images of what like Latina moms are and Latina women and I'm like I don't know whose model this is but my mom is the opposite of that okay um, I've talked to German women, like older German women who are like, oh no, that's how my mom is. I was like, well, I don't know. Like my mom must have some German or something because that's usually how German women are described. And now I'm realizing like, wow, this is crazy. But anyway, my mom is very, she, so she's not very direct and she won't ever tell me anything, if, you know, like, but she'll give me stories of others and how like they might be feeling because of something I wrote. <laughs> And so one of the, like the craziest has gotten because of like the stories that I share is like basically my mom saying that a cousin wrote a part of my book and was wondering why I said that so-and-so did this. And I was like, first of all, I didn't. I was very cautious. What's up with the family no bochinche? Right. Don't, don't do that. Like don't do the bochinche. Right. Yeah, I was like, I, I use no names. 
for this purpose because yeah. I'm telling my story. I'm not telling your story. And, I, and I'm very honest about that, even in the book, right? I say, I don't know if I said it out blatantly, but I know that in my process, I wanted to make sure that I was talking from my experience and not telling someone else's experience, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I think I just corrected my mom and was like, uh, I don't think they read it right because I didn't talk about that person at all. And that was literally like the extent to which my family has confronted me. We're not mm. a very, <laughs> like I said, we don't confront each other. She's she's not a very confrontational person. And I don't know that I talk, you know, I don't know that she would um, read it even, you know, I think yeah. she's a lot of what I say about just the pain that she carries. It's really hard for her to even, I think, uh, open herself up to like experiences like that um, because of just the fear I think of her like not coming out of that mm -hmm. yeah. I mean it all depends on where people are in their healing journey as well and you know yeah. uh, again thank you so much for writing Chingona it's definitely part of my own healing journey um, very last question because I think I'm getting the music like I am at the Oscars um, I see the looks uh, as a as a poderosa uh, what advice would you give to other poderosas um, who would like to write a book, um, who would like to, uh, you know, do their doctorate, uh, who would like to do just everything that you've accomplished? Uh, yeah. Advice from you. Yeah, I would just say, you know, not every cross is one that you need to bear. Um, and that is like a very spiritual saying. So I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit of what that means. But basically, like, you know, if you just want to be you and do the things that you love, and it doesn't include doing these like, you know, outwardly successful looking things that other people talk about, that's fine. You know, live your best life, live your life. Don't live someone else's life. Um, I would have never thought that I would have, that I was going to write a book, um, you know, and sometimes I do kind of feel like a farce, especially when I heard, when I hear, I heard Anna being interviewed and in like her MFA and just kind of going through this much more like creative process. I was like, man, I kind of feel like I just put my journals together and like <laughs> try to make sense of it. You know, I mean, it's, it's different because it's comparing apples and oranges, but all that to say, like, I, there's, there's just like so much that I think we put on ourselves and, and others put on us because of where we come from and, and because we need to be pioneers, but also we are entitled to just rest and chill and just be as well. And I would just encourage people to lean into that too, because we don't hear that enough as, as poderosas, that we also need that. Um, and I feel like there was one other thing that I was really wanting to share. Now I just like slipped my mind because I don't want to take up too much time either. Um, but yeah, you're welcome that, to put in the chat. So <laughs> if I remember, I'll, I'll let you know. But yeah, you know, I, I had to learn how to just be like, you know, maybe I'm not going to be that that full professor at a university level and I'm just going to pave the way for the next one. And that's OK. I'm going to be an adjunct professor at USC. I'm going to love it. I'm going to be the best at it. I'm going to have a full time, prof you know, I'm a full time at um, I'm a, at a nonprofit that works with first general income students. And that's just not for me. I'm just, I just don't want that struggle, you know, but if you want that struggle and you were built for that struggle, go for it, you know, but just don't take something on that. You're like, no, I don't want that. And you think that you just have to do it because I feel like you will, when you do start, start stepping into like what you really love and what you really want to be about things happen like this, like this book opportunity would not have happened if I was in a very toxic place for a long time, you know? So yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two snaps in a circle. You're amazing, Dr. ZP. Can we give her a round of applause, por favor? In Puerto <laughs> Rican, I put the oil at the end. Really appreciate <laughs> the generosity of your time. And uh, if you're ever in Chicago, let me know, girl. I got you. I will. <laughs> Thanks for the offer. Okay. Gracias, comadres. Our next interview is with Comadre Dora Maria Abreu a passionate tech professional with extensive experience in software engineering, program management, and training. She is also a certified motivational speaker, trainer, and coach. Building on her passion for technology and education delivery, she has helped community at large through mentoring, coaching, and providing programs on professional development, career development, leadership, and technical classes. Outside of work, she enjoys music, dance, sports, cinema, and photography. Interviewing her is Comadre Tess Tobin, project manager for the Las Comadres and Friends National Latino Book Club. She is the former president of Reforma, 
the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos and the Spanish Speaking. She has been a proud member of the book club since 2007 and enjoys promoting the work of Latino authors. Take it away, Comadre Tez. Hello, Dora. This is so exciting. I'm so happy to interview you and see you. Uh, I'd like to start with congratulations on adding children's book author to your already illustrious resume. So oh, congratulations thank you, thank you. on that. Congratulations. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about the book if those uh, have uh, with us haven't read it yet? So yes, um, the book is 18 Affirmations that you are reading to, or anyone, they could be reading to each other or they could be reading to a child. So the, the perfect setting would be two kids from two different backgrounds reading this book together and, or a parent uh, reading it to their child after a hard day at work and they're reading and they're saying, you are beautiful. And then the next page is saying, I am beautiful. So it's affirming the parent as well, or the other person that's reading the book. Um, but that's the essence of the book itself. Right, yes, it's, um, I do have a copy here just so everybody can see how, how beautiful it is. I'm not sure why it's upside down. There you go, Dora, <laughs> you got a better one, very good. Um, tell us, how did this come about? Tell us how you got uh, into writing this. I actually started writing a high school uh, journal and for high school students to help motivate them. And then I just started seeing the news, which I stayed away from for about a year or two. And I saw this glimpse of just these children um, just being depressed over COVID. And I said, oh, we have to change that. We have to help these kids you know, lift up their own spirits because these are tough times. And I didn't realize that young kids were really experiencing a disconnection from connection as well, right? And when you're going virtual, you kind of don't figure it out because you figure, hey, these kids all grew up in technology. They must love it. <laughs> but there's no connection there. And also they just felt very alone as well because they really weren't near anyone else. So that in-person connection is very important. And uh, so I took the affirmations out of this journal I was writing and I put it in a book to help encourage young kids and, and affirm whoever was reading it, most likely their parent or grandparent or caretaker. And I just felt like, hey, this is something that's gonna help them be more positive and hopefully uplift them and uh, that child as well. Right. It really comes across. So did you get these affirmations then that in the book from your from your journals, like you said, was it hard to to choose which ones or how was that process? So for me, one of the things I wanted um, was some of the affirmations that I grew up with and that I heard. Um, I really wanted to include some of the ones I heard as I was growing up, because those are the things that kind of motivated me as well when I was having a bad day at school or I just, you know, sometimes you like, I, I lost my mom when I was in college. So for me, that was my biggest motivator. And for her not to be around, I just really relied on her words of encouragement and just the memory of her just being so supportive. That's what got me through the hard times. So I wanted to make sure that I captured that essence as well. Right, right, very good. Um, was was it your choice then to publish the book, a bilingual book? Because as everybody should know, it's a bilingual book, English and Spanish, and um, it um, is very nice. So how did that come about? Well, a lot of it is that I come from a household that's a bilingual household, and I grew up speaking Spanish first. I don't know about the rest of you, but when you're a first generation, it's like not an option. Like everybody's speaking Spanish. And then when you go to school, then everyone starts speaking a little English, but we weren't allowed to speak English in school. We could only speak it, at, I mean, at home. We could only speak it at school. So it became like, okay, Spanish is in the house. English is at school. So it became <laughs> like, we always were in this bilingual mode. And, and then I thought, wow, we have so many people that don't know English. If I have this book to encourage and uplift these kids, how are they going to read the book to this child if they don't know what it says? So I was like, you know what? Let's do it for both languages and let's see if, if that helps in this effort that I'm trying. I, I want to have 
a whole generation of kind human beings? And how can we do that if we're not getting encouragement from the parents and those young people? Right, right. Um, how did you, how did you go about with the design of the book? I see, you know, there there's not an illustrator, but so were you very active in putting the content together that way? Yeah, I really wanted kids of all shapes, colors, sizes to just really pop out on the book because I really wanted kids to know that it doesn't matter what size, color, it doesn't nothing. None of those things really matter. You're a human being with another human being and that's what matters, right? And I felt like if I can get and capture all these kids, different kids all over, um, you will definitely, you know, like really love the book. And you'll see like one of the little kids is going like you because you are beautiful and it's like pointing them out, right? So that's what I wanted when I captured that essence. And in every page, I mean, I really tried to have kids from different backgrounds. I even have a kid on, in, in a wheelchair. Like I really wanted to capture like I went to school what did I see and I did see a kid in a wheelchair I saw a kid in crutches I, so it shouldn't matter that you have you know a disability a lot of kids have disabilities you don't see I mean some people could be deaf and you wouldn't even know because that's not a trait you see so and I have two nieces that are deaf and they're amazing and I felt like you know what I want to make sure that accessibility is captured in some way shape or form and so I felt the wheelchair was a one way of capturing that right so did you actually do the designs too were you did you use are they computer generated or oh no 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 i actually did stick figures of what i wanted to see on the book and i described it at length of what i wanted to see and then the publisher took care of the rest with the graphic and we went back and forth with the graphic artists but i the stick figures yeah no justice they really did a great job in capturing the essence of what i described and what i wanted to see in the book and and, and even in the pages right because I, I came back i'm like nope that's too many girls. I need some more boys in there and, you know, things like that. So it really came into fruition. And every page, like whatever the affirmation was, I tried to reaffirm it. So if it was something like, I am strong, you see the kid like, I am strong. And then I wanted a girl there, you know? And then in the ballerina, I had, a, I'm like, no, because it's always a girl that's a ballerina. Why couldn't it be a boy? And so I tried very intentionally to make it very even so that any kid could see themselves in this book. Yeah, no, it's really, um, it's very diverse and beautiful. And that's really great that you, you know, had such an active part, you know, you didn't leave it to somebody else. And it's kind of interesting how the little Latina girl looks like you, you know, I just, <laughs> um, I was looking at that. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, I read it, uh, there's a lot of reviews out there, you're getting a lot of nice feedback. I mean, like you said, it's a great book, people say, for those who don't know the language, you know, you have the bilingualism there, and then it's so inspirational. Some teachers say they're going to use it in the classroom, and then there's a lot of uh, mothers and children reading it. So um, uh, you must be really happy with that that feedback, right? No, I've been amazed and I've been encouraging people like, hey, donate some to your local like orphanage or like foster home or even senior centers. Like there's a lot of grandparents in senior centers. And when their kids come by to visit, like sometimes they don't even remember their kids or grandkids. And reading this book kind of like jolts a little bit of that memory. And and hopefully it starts to like reconnect some of those families. And and they get affirmed as as even as elderly, like that's one thing we all have in common. We all can use a little bit of affirmation. It doesn't matter what age we are. That's true, that's true. Um, are you working on anything else or what do, what do you have down the line? Um, actually, I have a, a part two of this book that I'm like looking at right now, but I'm actually looking at also an activity book for this. Um, I wanna do like waterproof, like flashcards of like just very simple words uh, for like younger age children. Uh, so we can start younger. It's It's something that has just really, impacted me. I didn't even think I was going to go down this path, but I really feel like right now our kids need encouragement every possible way that we can give it to them. And if I can go younger in age and do maybe flashcards or something that are waterproof, the kids can play with it when they're showering or taking a bath and they can read with the caretaker. And hopefully that'll encourage them as well. Um, and in an environment that's like a trust environment, right? When someone's 
bathing a child is like a lot of trust there like you know making sure but kid don't drown or something so I feel like the kid would be a lot more um, attentive to something with color and and that's when they learn colors and shapes so I want to see what you know what I can do in that space so I've been looking at that um, to see if I can complement this book with younger siblings and things like that oh that's wonderful yeah it definitely uh, teaches a lot of self-esteem and and as you're talking about it just the intergenerational aspect also is very very powerful so well, I'm so excited, Dora. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, I have to tell you, I do teach ESL at a sanctuary right now. And I think I'm gonna buy a bunch of these books and give them to the parents there because they are Latinos. And I think they just would love to see a book like this. So oh, thank, thank you, you so and, much. Thank you so much and wish you well on everything else. And uh, congratulations again, Dora. Yeah, thank you so much. I am working on other languages also, so that should be coming as well from the same book. I have it in Farsi and English as well wow. because I wanted to support the women in uh, women life freedom movement in Iran. Those youth are really, and it's the women, the young women that are really charging that effort um, to just give rights to young women. And uh, so I wanted to support that movement. So it's also in Farsi as well, oh, English wow. and Farsi. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Dora, I mean, I read that book to my mentee. The minute I knew you had it, I purchased it and I took it and she's six years old. And she, uh, I couldn't believe how it brightened her. And she would say, yo, and really, really got engaged with the book, really. Congratulations. Come uh, on thank you so much. <clears throat> A great book. Our thanks to authors Ana Reyes, Dr. Ana Zaragoza Petty, Dora Maria Abru, and their publishers, E.P. Dutton Publishing Company, Broadleaf Books, and Skinny Brown Dog for their generous donation of books to our early registrants. Thank you as well to our interviewers, Comadre Shirley, Lynn, and Tess. We thank our audience for taking the time to join us tonight and to those that submitted questions. And we'd like to thank all our volunteers Really, without you, this book club and all the work that's associated with it would not happen. Mil gracias. Please remember to support our authors by writing a review of their books on sites like Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes & Noble, and others. These reviews carry weight with the publishers as well as other readers. Buy a book to support our authors, and if your library doesn't have a book you want to read, ask them to order it. And please attend your virtual local book club meetings and bring a friend or two. It's important to note that our book club is open to men and women, or rather women and men, uh, Latinos and non-Latinos, all are welcome. Remember that these podcast teleconferences are available on our YouTube channel, uh, which is basically HTTPS, don't forget the S because it's a secure site, colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash at Las Comadres para las Americas slash videos. And that's found usually at the bottom of all our signatures. When Maria sends a message or, or I send a message, that link is there. Our June books are Irene with Wolf Medicine by Irene Blea. Comadre Irene, how wonderful to see your name here again. And When Trying to Return Home by Jennifer Maritza McCauley. Again, Thank you to all of you for your continued support of our book club and Latino literature. Please join us in celebrating Las Comadres and Friends National Latino Book Club throughout the year by buying books and supporting Latino authors. Good night. And as always, remember, read Latino Lit. <laughs>